Donald Trump is a flawed man who happens to be a good president. And if you understand the facts, that's pretty straightforward. Unfortunately, when it comes to Donald Trump, the facts do not matter. Hello, good people. It is Todd Shannon, data scientist, social commentator, getter of buckets. And today we are talking about Mr. Donald J. Trump. Now, uh, Donald Trump is a an interesting character. He's more like a Rorschach test than anything. In other words, what you see when you look at Donald Trump happens to be, generally speaking, more a reflection of who you are than what or who he is. Uh, because uh, it's impossible in, Don in this uh, current era, in this current uh, environment, to not have some opinions about Donald Trump that has been shaped by uh, certain voices or whatever influences that might be in your life. And and some of us on occasion, if we have enough information, can kind of sift through some of the noise and actually come to sensible conclusions. But here's the thing about sensible conclusions. You have to be able to come to sensible conclusions giving information in order for the facts to mean anything. And there's unfortunately a, a an enormous, you know, what the what the, some people called a psyop. A uh, psychological operation, which has basically completely mangled and destroyed people's ability to come to sensible conclusions about Donald Trump, especially, but about anything political uh, in general. So we're going to explore that. I'm going to give you a couple of examples of people's mind completely melting under the weight and the burden of actual facts. Right? That you see the cognitive dissonance kind of seeping in, and but it being they're being completely impervious to the facts. And I'm going to show you how we get to that point because you may not understand that the, this inability to process facts is intentional in the, um, the work of some very nefarious uh, deeds and powers out there. So I'm going to give you hard facts and actual examples of what the truth is about this, this, this so-called felonious activity of one Donald J. Trump. Let's have a listen. But this has absolutely nothing to do with the law. As was noted earlier, at most you're talking about a, a misdemeanor that would have already expired under the statute of limitations. I'm not even convinced that there was really a misdemeanor that Trump committed. So my fellow panelist here is celebrating that, that the rule of law has been vindicated and overturned 234 years of American legal tradition. I would challenge her to see if she could possibly articulate how and what crime Trump committed. Because so far, Alvin Bragg, the DA, has failed to do so. The, the judge in the case, Judge Marchand, has failed to do so and they can't do it because trump didn't commit any of the crimes for which he's been convicted now just really quick so that's you know obviously michael knowles is my guy he talks pretty fast but i want you to understand what's happening here what he's explaining he's basically explaining that the supposed crimes uh that he committed uh they haven't even actually named this is actually quite spectacularly uh egregious because um to, to be charged, to be found guilty of something that they have not even specifically named is, I, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I'm not a lawyer. I don't understand legal precedent, but it seems like something that I've never heard of ever in my entire life. And so how this is even possible is crazy. But basically, they haven't named his actual crimes, even though they found him guilty. What did they find him guilty of? That seems like it would be an important detail. And he's talking about the supposed misdemeanor that kind of they upgraded to a felony. I don't have time to go into all uh, the details, but um, suffice it to say these uh, these uh, so-called crimes or it seems like a bit of a cooking of the books here. And as Michael Knoll said, has nothing to do with the law. So let's see if this young lady in the red, let's see if she can actually describe what it is Donald Trump did wrong. Well, let's just ask quickly before I go to Kevin. Francesca, just on that point, what crime did Trump commit? He, it was it was camp it was financial crimes it was white collar crimes it was it, what that was it? is exactly Which what one, they though? charged him it was he was convicted on just so you know white collar crime is not a proper category it's a category but it's not an actual when you look up someone what someone's been convicted of it doesn't say on the on the uh, on the on the statutes white collar crime that's just a colloquial kind of general term what was the crime it's new york state law I understand. What's the, it, what was the crime? It is 
Francesca I gotta, actually. I, I don't even not, like it. It is well, hang literally on, hang on, he on, just on. got convicted on thirty-four counts. Francesca, what of, was the of, crime? Ac- of like cooking the actual books. What was the crime? You are not allowed. So you are not allowed to to use your own financial, like your own money, to pay off somebody, and then he wrote, he he logged it as something different. He logged it as just a regular payment, <laughs> but he was actually paying off this porn star to keep quiet. I wish I had a graphic. Uh, you know that little, uh, if you've got a Mac or whatever, you got that little pinwheel that kind of shows up on your screen when the computer is stuck, it's thinking, and it can't process. That I want to put one of those right above her head because that's what's happening right now. She's like, oh, dude, financial, dude, you can't. It, it. She doesn't know what she's talking about, obviously. And this uh, this whole segment here on Pierce Morgan, it's about 30 minutes. This this lady, the typical, honestly, Trump deranged kind of lefty, uh, goes into this just complete tirade of how felonious and terrible Donald Trump is. And then he asks her a simple question. Well, what did he do wrong? And she can't answer it. Which, if he hadn't been running for president, would not have mattered, but he was. And so it impacted campaign finance laws in New York State. Okay, that is what one Rachan just oversaw this. Okay. Alvin Bragg okay. brought these charges that's, because that's Michael not, Cohen and Sixer was happened. already okay. sentenced okay. to three years okay. to do it. Okay, let's just go before. Kevin, I'd be very, very, very patient. But I will I'm come no, to you. Look, I'm no expert. Let me just say, hang on. No, no, Michael, you are Michael, no expert. By the that's way. Francesca. The campaign finance law is a federal law. Hang on, anyway. Francesca. Yes, you are no Mark. expert. You're the lawyer. Is anything Francesca just said, is that actually the crime? Now, I want you to pay very close attention because this guy is an attorney and a Democrat. Listen to what he says. Look, let me just say, I like Francesca a lot. I was, and we probably agree on 80% of our worldviews. However, Francesca, that that what, the way you just described it, call me afterwards and I'll educate you because that's not what happened. There was no theory that was given to the, to the jurors. The jurors were told it could have been campaign finance. It could have been tax. It could have been false books. They were told they didn't have to specify and specifically told they did not have to agree unanimously. That's what irks me. Lifelong Democrat, no fan of Trump, never voted for Trump, never will. But I will tell you, as somebody who has spent his entire career with kind of taking on unpopular causes and holding the government accountable, um, I have to tell you, I do that for a reason. And it, the reason is, this kind of shenanigans, and that's the best light I can spin it, on in, in the criminal courts has no place in a federal election. No, the, I agree. the campaign finance but, laws but, but, were federal, not state, and the state laws had nothing okay, to do with it. Okay, I want to go, I want to go to, hang on, I want to go to Kevin, be waiting very patiently. Kevin. Now, uh, we won't watch the rest of this here, but this girl in the red, as you, as you might have suspected, That explanation by a lawyer, an expert lawyer who understands the statutes and the law very well, who is a Democrat and a person who is against Trump, succinctly explaining to her that she doesn't know what she's talking about. Do you think that that changed her view or position in the slightest? Of course it didn't. And this is what I'm talking about when we talk about ideology making you impervious to the facts. See, the facts only matter if your mind isn't completely captured by specific ideologies. I want to give you another example because this sort of thing goes on and it's actually quite egregious. This is the, this to me is an even worse example because not only do we get into the details and the minutia of the actual law for which there was no basis under the law to charge Donald Trump for these crimes, according to a anti-Trump lawyer, But here we're going to listen to another lawyer, a guy by the name of Alan Dershowitz, who is one of the most influential attorneys in the world. Not just, you know, (laughs) this 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 is not some local, you know, you know, ambulance chaser, a guy, you know, trying to get workers comp claim insurance for uh, injured clients. This guy understands the law, understands the Constitution, one of the most one of the greatest legal minds uh, universally considered. And he's going to explain how the judge basically manipulated evidence so that the, that the jury couldn't hear why, in fact, Donald Trump had not actually va- violated the supposed uh, um, statute about uh, campaign finance. 
might okay, chin up okay. his base. Hang on, Benny. It might chin up his base. It may, I gave on. you guys time. Let me just say one thing. It might chin up his base, and his base is dangerous, but they were always going to be ginned up. It's that portion of America, these little margins that we're winning by now, that is, feels like this is a disgusting action, whether it's one case, two cases, three cases. That jury found 34 counts him guilty, and that jury had lawyers on it, people who voted for Trump. So clearly, they made a strong case, Mr. Dershowitz. You cannot deny that. Oh, I can deny that, and I will deny it. Let me give you another argument. So the prosecution argued that it was, as a matter of fact, an illegal campaign contribution. As a matter of fact, they had a witness, Trump, who is the FEC expert, who said, I will testify, as a matter of fact, that it was not a campaign by and it's done all the time, that nobody has ever been prosecuted for it. It was perfectly legal, and the judge kept that out. The judge denied the jury the right to hear from the expert that it wasn't an illegal campaign contribution because the prosecution yet argued, yes, as a matter of fact, it was. That's clear reversible error. If we had another two hours, I could go down 30 reversible errors. I've never seen a case. Well, maybe you should work for Trump again. He needs your help. So he has an appeal coming up. These are great arguments back. But it didn't hold up last week. So you see the... This uh, Trump deranged nut job liberal white woman, she she can't hear the truth, and because he's making so much sense, I know her brain starts melting, and she so she has to interrupt him and talk over him. Well, maybe you should talk to. Uh, notice she doesn't refute anything he says. Well, maybe you should start working for Trump because uh, they need you. We just watched two Democrats who are attorneys say that this this conclusion has no legal basis. One. The judge actually said, hmm, you know what? You don't even have to agree on what he did wrong. You know, it's just, you know, something, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's tax, maybe it's falsifying records, maybe it's, uh, you know, campaign finance, whatever. You, you can you just pick one. You don't even have to all agree on what that one is, just as long as you think he did something wrong. And then also, uh, we're going to take this, uh, F, uh, this expert who is an expert in campaign finance who will testify to the fact that Trump did not actually violate campaign finance laws, which was the in the sole basis for this crime being resurrected, which was passed the statute of limitations five years ago. But they were said because it was in service of this supposed campaign finance violation, which in fact, they said, as a matter of fact, this was an in-kind contribution and in violation of campaign finance laws. They said, well, this one guy who's an expert says he didn't actually violate the law. So what does the judge do? You can't hear that guy's testimony. Now, if you're going to tell me that the 34 felony violations were legitimate in any way, despite those facts, then you can't reach sensible conclusions because you have been captured ideologically. And I want to explain to you how this sort of ideological capture, making people completely impervious to facts, how it comes about. Some time ago, I learned about a former KGB officer, a KGB defector, a guy by the name of Yuri Bezmenov. And Yuri Bezmenov explains in great detail how people become impervious to facts through propaganda. He knows this because he was trained and ideological subversion and propaganda tactics. And when the Russian KGB, when the Communist Party, when they wanted to go into a target country and cause it to basically implode, he just basically said, hey, if you're at war with a country, th the last thing you want to do is go in there and shoot the people and blow stuff up and have this carnage. That's a very primitive form of war. The way you want to actually engage in war is through psychology, through changing the people's minds psychological warfare such that you screw the people's situation up such that they no longer see you as an enemy. And he explains how this is accomplished. So let's look at uh, what he has to say so we can explain kind of how these people become so brainwashed. It's a slow process which we call either ideological subversion or active measures, actively мероприятия in the language of, of the KGB, or psychological warfare. What it basically means is to change the perception of reality of every American to such an extent that despite of the abundance of information, no one is able to come to sensible conclusions 
in the interests of defending themselves, their families, their community, and their country. It's a great brainwashing uh, process, which goes very slow, and it's divided in, in four basic stages. Uh, the first one being demoralization. It takes from 15 to 20 years to demoralize a nation. Why that many years? Because this is the minimum number of years which requires to uh, educate one generation of students in the country of, of, of your enemy, exposed to the ideology of the enemy. In other words, Marxism-Leninism ideology is being pumped into the soft heads of, of, of at least three generations of American students without being challenged or counterbalanced by the basic values of Americanism, American patriotism. The result, the result you can see, most of the people who graduated in the 60s, dropouts or half-baked intellectuals, are now occupying the positions of power in the government, civil service, business, mass media, educational system. You are stuck with them. You cannot get rid of them. They are contaminated. They are programmed to think and react to certain stimuli in a certain pattern. You cannot change their mind, even if you, if you expose them to authentic information, even if you prove that white is white and black is, uh, is black, you still cannot change the basic perception and the logic of behavior. In other words, these people, uh, uh, the process of demoralization is complete and irreversible. To get rid of society of these people, you, have, you need another 20 or, or, or 15 years to educate a new generation of patriotically minded and, and, and uh, common, common sense people. So that was a lot. I wanted to let him talk because I didn't want to break that stream of consciousness here. But I want you to understand what he just said. He just said, we go in and we, we cause, you know, we do this ideological subversion and we demoralize the people such that they get to the place where they cannot respond to facts. It doesn't matter if you prove to them that they're wrong. It doesn't matter what you say. They won't budge. And I have to say, I think what people do not understand is the psychological operation, the PSYOP, that has been done on the American people and, and uh, a particular portion of the population that is near and dear to my heart, which I call, which is the black church. The black church doesn't understand how it has been infiltrated and psychologically manipulated to serve, to be at the beck and call of radical leftists and people with this sort of propagand propagandistic and subversive tactics that Mr. Yuri Bezmenov is describing. There's a gentleman, and one day I'm going to do a video on it, and it's hard to do these kind of videos because if you don't ride the wave of the algorithm, uh, you know, no one watches it, right? I'll do these videos, I'll spend hours on it, and then nobody will watch it. So it's difficult to do that. But there's a gentleman who, um, he was actually a contemporary of Dr. Martin Luther King, and for some reason his name is escaping me. Hey, y'all, I'm editing this video, and I suddenly remembered the name of the gentleman I was talking about in the video. His name is Manning Johnson. And Manning Johnson was a contemporary of Dr. Martin Luther King. He was a part of the Communist Party, and he came out of it a uh, devout Christian. He actually died uh, quite early as well. So if you're interested, look up Manning Johnson, and I'll maybe do a video on it later. I can see his face right now, but he basically was, he was a full-fledged member of the Communist Party. And he, he exposed how they recruited him and how uh, Dr. King and, uh, and, you know, during the civil rights movement, uh, back when they were on, their, uh, on the, uh, the ascent, and how these people recruited people in the black church, more specifically preachers. I want you to hear what I'm saying. They began to recruit preachers to basically present the propaganda of the Communist Party. And these people were, this gentleman that I was speaking of was a black man. He was a, he was a follower of Christ. And then he started to realize that these people were wicked and he broke away and he began to speak about them. But he was Dr. Martin Luther King's contemporary. And so you understand now the kind of the origins of this kind of uh, commitment to left-wing ideology in the black church and the way they got roped in to that sort of ideology was that they promised the people uh equality right they you know they were they had the kind of the anti-racist 
uh, kind of, uh, of, of, of angle. It was like, Hey, you know, these people, they, you know, they hate you because of your skin color, but you know, through communism, through, uh, through our, 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 our ideology, we, we, we promote equality, the equality of all people. And not only uh, racial equality, but economic equality. And so you see the whole thing, the whole idea of so-called equity and where that stuff comes from. It's, it's all one big psyop. And I don't have, once again, I don't have time to go into it deeply into the, in this video. But I want to just put a bow on this kind of uh, uh, idea that I had. Just a couple of weeks ago, we watched a movie called Inception. And I, I saw Inception. It's a movie uh, starring Leonardo DiCaprio about basically how to plant ideas into people's minds, but also plant, plant them in their minds such that they don't know that the idea came from somewhere else. And that's the whole balance. That's the whole kind of plot of the movie. And so they kind of developed this way to effectively go into people's dream states and plant ideas in their mind, because if you can plant it in their mind and deeply in the subconscious, that's how you can get away with planting an idea in their mind without them knowing that the idea didn't originally start with them. But the point is, is that this idea that black people tend to have in their minds about equity and equality and being hypersensitive to racism, we think that that's something that is native to us. We think that that's something that we do because racism is all around us and because we have to be sure that we are being treated with dignity and respect. And much of those ideas, the majority of them, do not come from us, but they were incepted. These ideas were planted into our minds by those who used to use us for their ideological ends. And it is my hope that someday we will not be impervious to the facts. To come back to Donald Trump, Donald Trump is a flawed man who happened to be a good president. And if you can't see that the way we are being manipulated as a community is, a, is the result of this long, long process of psychological uh, propaganda and demoralization, then we're never going to be able to accept the facts. We're never going to be able to wake up out of this dream. And so I hope that we can do that. Let me know what your thoughts are, though. Do you, uh, do you think that, uh, that Donald Trump, for example, that he's being uh, unfairly treated? Do you think that it's pretty much a fact that these so-called felonies, these 34 felonies he was con con convicted of, do you think that's some sort of, uh, you know, ruse or do you think it was legitimate? I'd like to know what your thoughts are. Make sure you leave a comment in the comment section and like, share and subscribe if you like this content. Until next time, my friends, God bless you.